This is the third lecture on day two of the short course at UNAVCO on GNSS data processing and analysis with Gamut Globe K and Track. My name is Mike Floyd and I'll be presenting this lecture on generating velocity solutions with Globe K. For the overview, um, we'll talk about the basics of, of uh, velocity solutions, which in general are invoked by uh, setting the APR NEU or APR site command in the Globe K command file to include uh, non zero terms for the uh, velocity sigmas, which is the uh, seven, uh, six, fifth, sixth, and seventh uh, arguments to this. Uh, command. We'll talk about the strategies for setting up the solutions and because they can take quite a long time to run if you have very long or very large uh, networks. Uh, we'll talk about how to um, improve uh, your likelihood of getting a, a good uh, solution on the first run, um, speeding up those solutions, uh, methods for cleaning up the potential problems, uh, how to uh, to uh, change your reference frame uh, quickly after you've run uh, Globe K, and some examples uh, showing you um, how these uh, different strategies can work. Uh, one of the things that we need to bear in mind here is that these solutions uh, involve making a lot of decisions about how you want to uh, build your solution. Um, for uh, gamut, uh, the um, basic process is to, uh, to take the phase and pseudo range data and turn it into a loosely constrained network solution. Whereas in Globe K, uh, this is the point at which a lot of people's fundamental ideas behind what they want out of Globe K might diverge. Some people might want time series, some people might want velocities, other people might want uh, atmospheric uh, delay parameters. Uh, and so it really depends on exactly what you want to do, uh, how you set up your Globe K command files. So with the um, velocity solutions, uh, the aim is really to combine uh, many sites over many years, at least two and a half years to three years for geophysically meaningful velocities with an appropriately precise estimate of velocities. Uh, we want to generate those solutions that include position, velocity, uh, the offset at discontinuities like earthquakes uh, and equipment changes, and uh, potentially other uh, um, uh, aspects like post seismic parameter estimates for after large earthquakes. Depending on how much data you're processing, uh, it is quite common that these Globe K solutions get up into the region of thousands, if not 10,000s of parameters. If you have very large networks across the whole globe, let's say several hundred or even a thousand or 2000 sites, and you are processing uh, that solution over perhaps 10, 15 or 20 years. If you have that much data available, um, then it is very common uh, that these velocity solutions will uh, have a number of parameters that is up in the thousands to ten thousands range. That means that the Globe K run itself can take a very long time for small networks for a short time. Globe K can run in seconds to minutes, but for these very, very large solutions, hundreds to thousands of sites over tens of years, uh, it can take hours or even a day to run. And that's why we'll talk about some uh, prototyping methods later in this talk. The basic input requirements for the Globe K velocity solution is much like the time series solutions. We need an a priori uh, position and velocity file, uh, a priori coordinate file. This is used as a check on the positions coming in from the daily solutions. And uh, if it's seen that a particular solution is, is divergent or um, is otherwise uh, poor quality compared to the a priori coordinate or the current status of the coordinate solution, then it will be edited out as bad. And uh, 
and the adjustments uh, will be estimated relative to these um, a priori values. That's really what we're estimating here is the adjustments. Added to the a priori value, uh, the adjustment creates the final uh, estimate. Um, and uh, so one way of us determining uh, how confidently we know the a priori values is assigning those a priori sigmas in the APR NEU uh, line or APR site line. We also uh, want to put in an uh, earthquake uh, file which can specify when earthquakes or discontinuities and other miscellaneous uh, perturbations of the site uh, might affect the solution and so therefore these earthquakes and discontinuities will be taken into account as we estimate uh, positions and velocities otherwise. So it's very critical that this file reflects correctly uh, the data that you are feeding into GlobeK. For example, if you have an earthquake, data before an earthquake and data after an earthquake with an earthquake in the middle, you need to make sure that in order to get an accurate solution, that earthquake is accounted for in the GlobeK command file. Otherwise, it will skew the solution and your velocities will not make sense. We also need to add process noise parameters. Uh, this is in Globe K, the Kalman filter is able to uh, ingest random walk values, uh, which can account for the temporal correlations in the time series. We know from geodetic time series studies that each individual time series point is not truly independent. There are temporal correlations between points and those temporal correlations affect the statistics of the uncertainty on the velocity, the standard deviations on the velocity estimates. So if we don't account for those process noise, uh, those, those temporally correlated noise parameters correctly, we can end up with uh, uncertainties that are unrealistically small. And one of the ways that we uh, deal with uh, this process noise estimation that we can then feed into GlobeK is with the script shgenstats, uh, which works on the time series and TSFIT output. Um, and we can also get similar uh, estimates by using shcats and shhector. But uh, again, as we've said before, those programs actually require third party uh, installation. So the strategies uh, that we can take when uh, creating velocity solutions is, in general, we need to be very careful with the setup. Uh, Globe K expects a lot more accuracy than Gamut does in terms of uh, a priori coordinates and things like that. In previous lectures, we have talked about uh, an a priori coordinate being accurate to about 10 meters or better is good enough for Gamut. Well, an a priori coordinate for Globe K really needs to be accurate to a level of centimeters. Um, and so setting up an a priori coordinate file is very important before running Globe K. Similarly, the earthquake file and process noise files should be carefully built before running uh, Globe K. And these again can be um, built by base, uh, based on the knowledge that you have of the time series. The reason why we say that is careful, uh, you need to be careful to set these things up is if you do have one of these very large solutions, um, it can take hours to a day uh, to actually run the Globe K solution, after which you find out that the result actually didn't take into account everything that you needed to, you were missing an earthquake or you were missing an antenna change in your definitions of discontinuities, for example. And so it can take you many days if that's the case, to reiterate your solutions to be ultimately correct. <clears throat> so if we want to try and speed this process up a little bit, we can iterate generating the velocity solution. Um, for example, we could break down the solution into subnetworks and uh, to create good a priori coordinates, we could just run subnetworks of 20 to 200 sites at a time, uh, gain an improved uh, position and velocity estimate, uh, either from a Globe K run or time series, 
and then feed that information back into an a priori coordinate file that we will slowly build up subnetwork by subnetwork before running the network as a whole. Uh, time series can be used uh, um, um, to, um, to test whether the uh, earthquake files and the a priori coordinate files are suitably accurate. Um, we can look at the time series to see if there are any steps that we may have missed uh, that need to be accounted for and added. So there is a slightly iterative approach to bringing these uh, solutions together. <clears throat> These steps above uh, are often repeated. Uh, perhaps we might try different sets of 20 to 200 sites uh, to build our a priori uh, coordinate files and the earthquake files um, until, until we have all of the, uh, the, the, the input files that we need. Um, having uh, new stations um, and uh, bad process, process noise models can, can cause uh, significant uh, differences in the, the uh, solution compared to what you expect. So the aim here is really to make sure that when we eventually run the large solution, which may take you know, a day or two of CPU time, that we've set everything up well enough by experimenting beforehand that the run completes successfully and properly as we expect it to. So before the velocity runs, uh, we might do something like this. If we're doing survey work, uh, we could combine the surveys into one solution per survey. This means that we only have one H file, binary H file, a combined binary H file, moving forwards into the longer term velocity solution. When we do that, there's no need to rerun GL red for a, a long time series to complete a long, a long time series time series plot. If you have multiple .org files from various different surveys or continuous sites that have been combined monthly, something like that, those can be read directly into TSSUM or SHPlotPos um, as a number of .org files in the final argument. So in this case, for example, we would run TSSUM on uh, two or more separate org files, one for the first survey, one for the second survey, and so on and so on. These will all be read in together and the output time series uh, will be combined over the long term. We could also do effectively the same thing by using the minus F option to read in the org files to shplotpos and then using the minus K option to say we want to keep the pos files that are created from these org files. They, those two sequences of commands would do exactly the same thing. So now let's look again at some long-term time series, the difference between these time series that we show here and the time series that we showed in previous lectures is that now the time axis is in years. We are looking at a much longer time period, whereas before we were only looking at a few days in a month uh, that constituted uh, a campaign, a, a survey. Uh, and here, uh, again, you can see uh, reasonable repeatability here. The scatter between points is quite small compared to the error bars on those points. Um, so this uh, represents a reasonable weighting of uh, the time series points compared to uh, the movement of the site. In the right-hand plot, we see an outlier in the vertical component at the bottom in 1998. And this, if we don't take care of it, could potentially corrupt the Globe K solution when all of this data from 1994, 1998, 2007 and 2010 is all read in to the Globe K uh, and 2014, uh, when that's all read into the Globe K. If we don't account for this vertical outlier in 1998, that could corrupt the solution. So the options that we have here are that we could increase the error bars on this point so that they are approximately uh, in line with the trend of the other sites in the vertical time series, or we could exclude this point completely. Generally speaking, if the points associated with the other components are good, which they are here in the north and the east component, 
we probably don't want to remove the 1998 data completely. We just simply want to downweight the uh, vertical component. And that would mean uh, in including a sig underscore neu command, uh, adding a certain amount of white noise, a certain amount of uncertainty to this point only, and leaving the horizontal components alone. If we did want to exclude outliers or segments of data, this is just a, to repeat, a, to reiterate uh, a slide that was in the time series talk. Uh, this is how we would uh, go about excluding data if we really wanted to do that. We would use these rename commands and either rename the site to have an XPS or an XCL suffix for uh, a certain H file or H files or over a particular time interval. Or in the last line here, that would mean from this point forwards forever. And then finally, uh, once we've done our checks on the time series, as we, uh, as we spoke about in the previous talk as well, we can finally get around to running Globe K. Similar to the time series, uh, we would first create our a list of binary H files that we want to include in the velocity solution. And at this point, when you're, uh, when you're running gamut, you will generally do year by year because the tables associated with a gamut run are only valid for one year at a time. So you might have a gamut run with a 2010 directory and underneath that you would have a number of days, 001, 002, 003. You might then have a 2011 directory, a 2012 directory, all of which have a, a GSOLM directory, G-S-O-L-M, where you did the combination or you looked at time series. Now that we're processing many, many years of data, we actually want to create a VSOLM directory for ourselves at the same level as the gamut years. And this will be where we do the long term uh, time series and velocity solution. <laughs> Once we've created the list of H files that we want to include in the long term solution uh, in our GDL file, our global directory list file, we can run glist uh, to see something about the size of the solution, the number of parameters, the number of sites, the length of time. And it's very much recommended to run this uh, to get a summary of what to expect from the Globe K run uh, before running uh, Globe K for a long period of time or a very large network. GList can help with this uh, because it can also read uh, earthquake files and the a priori coordinate file as well in exactly the same way as Globe K would and it would use those a priori files and the earthquake files to actually do the summary information. So you would, you, you would run GList with exactly the same earthquake files and a priori files as you intend to run Globe K. And that would give you um, uh, some information about if there's something missing or, or you have extra sites that you weren't expecting by reviewing the output summary information of GList. Once you've done that, uh, you can then run Globe K. Uh, and as we've said a couple of times, this may take many hours uh, for a very large network or very long time span. Generally, uh, it will take just a few seconds or a few minutes if you have very little data, but please be aware that if you are processing very large networks, hundreds of sites over a very long time, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, then this will take a long time. So that's why we want to warn you about doing these preliminary check steps. One of the ways that we can um, uh, create uh, some of the, 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 the a priori coordinate information is to actually use the time series fits with the earthquake file and the a priori information as well to generate uh, uh, updated a priori site uh, coordinates. So if you use the earthquake file that you intend to use in Globe K along with the time series, TS fit will estimate and output a priori site coordinates given those time series and the discontinuities that you've defined in the earthquake file. Just be careful um, that in the uh, standard GG tables IGB 14 dot uh, APR files, uh, this is the official IGS definition of site positions and velocities. 
And some of the velocities do change um, after earthquakes, for example, the IGS definition might have slight differences, slight permutations, uh, and um, not necessarily cause inconsistent coordinates, but you might be expecting something to have equal velocity before and after an earthquake. And so you can run this Unify APR uh, program to be safe, uh, to make sure that you do have equal velocities going in so that you have equal velocities coming out for the same site before and after a, a discontinuity event, if that's what you expect. Once we've run uh, Globe K, uh, we may want to actually change the reference frame from, uh, generally we would uh, produce a, a reference frame in the no net rotation, ITRF 2014, but maybe you want it relative to a plate like Africa or North America or Europe, Eurasia. And we can do that with this module GLORG, which is the last module to be run in Globe K, if you have included the org underscore CMD option in the Globe K command file. This will initiate the glorg run uh, using the glorg command file from within Globe K. But we can then run glorg separately using uh, the same or a similar uh, glorg command file to uh, quickly change the reference frame. We don't need to do the combination of all the H files again. We just want to express our solution in a potentially different reference frame or using different sites to stabilize the reference frame. Running glorg separately after a very long globe K run can speed this uh, process up significantly because glorg runs much, much quicker than globe K. But we must have saved the .com file from the globe K run. So that can be done by including explicitly this com underscore file option in your globe K command file. When we run globe K, uh, it's very similar to the uh, GL red uh, command syntax. We have an output file, we have a log file, we have an input list of H files to process and the globe K command file. If we have this uh, option in the globe K command file, then we will have a .com file output, and that can be read into any secondary glorg files to change the reference frame. So for example, here, the first globe K command might output the globe K underscore vel uh, .org file, with uh, coordinates in an ITRF 2014 reference frame. If we wanted to express that relative to North America, we could run glorg separately, create a second .org file with the NOAM North America um, name in there so that we know what it's relative to. And the input file would be this vel.com file that came from the first globe K command. We also need to make sure that we do not delete the scratch files. So this is uh, deleting scratch files, intermediary files in the Globe K process. So do not use the Dell Scra yes option in your Vel, uh, Globe K command file if you want to keep the .com file. And lastly, we need to make sure that uh, uh, the, the parameters are loosely constrained so that we can continue to rotate and translate them as necessary to define a different type of reference frame. Um, so that may, we mean to make sure that all parameters are loosely constrained in, uh, in Globe K uh, using the APR NEU or APR site commands. If we don't have uh, EOP estimates to keep loose, we can actually uh, allow the system to rotate and translate by using the explicit APR rot and APR tran commands instead. Now, an important aspect with all this talk of discontinuity and earthquakes is the use of equates. It's very common, I can imagine uh, that you well know that uh, a step in a time series may change the position 
of a site due to an earthquake or a change of equipment, but that doesn't mean that the site moves differently over time. The velocity before the discontinuity or the earthquake may be the same, in fact, probably usually is the same before and after the earthquake. So in this case, we actually want to have two solutions, one before a discontinuity and one after a discontinuity, that we equate the velocity estimate so that we have one velocity for a time series that has been split in two by a step. The way that we do this um, is that we can uh, include a series of equate commands in the glorg command file. It should be noticed, uh, noted here that the thing that's actually being equated are the adjustments to the parameters. Again, the way that uh, the globe K Kalman filter works is it has a priori information. It estimates adjustments to that a priori information. And then the final estimate is the a priori plus the adjustment to the parameter. And what we are equating here is the adjustment to the parameter. So if we want the final parameter estimate to be equal before and after an equate, we need to have the a priori information equal before and after an event. And we need to equate the adjustments to the velocity before and after the event. Two ways of doing this, uh, we could use an eqdist command, which means that we will try to equate the parameter adjustments at sites separated by up to a certain distance. Uh, this is generally helpful if you have uh, co-located sites, perhaps you have two sites that are within 100 meters of one another, and you know that there's really no tectonic difference between one site and the other. They should really be approximately the same velocity. So in order to strengthen your solution, you might want to equate those two sites. And in that case, you could use the eqdist 100 option, for example, and that would use a distance of 100 meters uh, to equate two sites separated by that distance or less. You could also uh, be specific that you only want sites with the same four character name to be equated. And for that, we can use the EQ4 char option. Um, and this is uh, helpful for uh, making sure that we only um, use equates at exactly the same site. For example, um, where uh, one receiver shares antennas, they're technically two different sites, two different antennas, and you might want to see how those antennas behave differently. Um, so uh, you may well uh, want to uh, not use the dist command in that case, but use the EQ4 char uh, option instead. In the org file, the .org file that gets output, you will see a series of chi-squared uh, increments which tell you how successful, how statistically successful the equates were. And it allows us to assess whether they are, uh, those equates are realistic uh, or not within a statistical framework. For example, it may be the case that after an earthquake, a site actually does move with a different velocity to before the earthquake. And in that case, we don't want to equate the velocity before and after an earthquake. We actually want them to be different and we want the data to estimate that difference. But if we use the eqdist or the eq4 char command, we will automatically try to equate those. If the chi-squared increment shows that that is not a realistic equate, then we can unequate specific uh, equates to mean that for example, a site that moves differently before and after, after an earthquake is then not equated. So here, for example, we could use the unequate command with the north velocity of one site and the north velocity of, of the site after the earthquake unequated. Again, just to reiterate the fact that we are equating or unequating uh, the adjustments to the parameters here, and if you want the final parameter estimate to be equal before and after an event, 
then you also need to make sure that the a priori information is equal. And that means uh, that we sometimes need to uh, make changes to the a priori coordinate file to ensure that the a priori information is the same for sites that are going to be equated. We can do that automatically by adding the fix a option to the glorg command line. Um, but in general, it's better to make sure that you have an a priori file that you understand and is consistent for what you expect. The script shgenstats allows us to uh, feed in the uh, estimates of temporarily correlated noise to the globe k Kalman filter. And this is done uh, by the uh, use of the time series. And we, again, we may uh, iterate this uh, a little bit uh, depending on, on how clean the time series are because the uh, time series um, cleanliness, the outliers, the uh, accurate depiction of steps and discontinuities will actually affect the level of random warp noise, process noise that is estimated. So we might generate time series using some uh, reference frame sites that we know to be very good for example, uh, IGB-14 sites. We could fit the time series using TSFIT to estimate outliers, uh, the size of earthquakes, whether a log is needed and other discontinuities, and produce a self-consistent a priori file. We can also ask uh, TSFIT to use what we call the FOGMEX model. We used to call it the realistic sigma algorithm uh, to estimate the magnitude of temporarily correlated noise that we can then use shgenstats to create a file that we can input to globe k. Once we do that um, we can run globe k uh, again um, with those estimates of the a priori coordinates and the temporarily correlated noise to define the reference frame in the same way and potentially then regenerate the time series with those updated estimates of uh, a priori coordinates and noise in order to, to, uh, to do the same exercise with the network as a whole and use all sites to define the reference frame. We can uh, compare different velocity solutions um, to show what the effect of uh, using uh, some of these different approaches might be. Um, so for example, we can use this script shexglk extract globe k to translate um, or, or extract the uh, velocity information from the .org file coming from globe k into a simple summary of the velocities. Um, if we do that with several different types of experiment, for example, maybe we use different definitions of the stabilizing sites. Uh, perhaps we have decimated our solution. Perhaps we use the time series to estimate the velocities. Perhaps we use globe K, the Kalman filter, to estimate velocities. We can then compare these .vel files with a program velrot. A basic uh, way of running it would be uh, like given here, we could use velrot with our first solution vel file. Uh, we could uh, give the um, reference frame that that velocity is, is uh, expressed in. So for example here, if song a dot vel is given in the North America 14 reference frame and song b dot vel is given an IGB 14 reference frame, we can, exp we can uh, uh, produce that detail on the velrot command line. And then velrot will rotate these two velocity files into a consistent reference frame and then compare them to see what the differences are, how much they differ. And we can look at the statistics by grepping on an S, capital S, at the beginning of the line in the output. So let's look at an example. Here, we are looking at an example of decimation. We've said a couple of times this lecture that uh, we have um, uh, potentially very large solutions where uh, we don't want to run the whole thing. We want to speed up our solution. One way of doing that might be to only use 
one day a week over many years instead of each day the, over, over the same time period. So here we have uh, VEL files that have been created by using only the first day of the week in the NMT VEL 150418 day one file. We have a solution where it uh, decimated every seven days and used the third day of the week only in the day three file. And if we use only day five of the week and decimate the solution to use only one in every seven input files, we get the output of day five. And here, grepping on that capital S at the beginning of the line shows you the statistics comparing these two different approaches of creating the velocity solution. And you can see that the, all of the components are uh, well beneath the 0.1 millimeter per year level in terms of their differences. The scatter, uh, the RMS, the, the weighted root mean square residual between the files, again, is extremely small. Um, and the uncertainties seem to be uh, appropriate for the level of uh, difference because the normalized RMS is much smaller than one. If we compare day one and day five, we see much the same pattern, very, very small differences. And, and day three and day five, again, the differences between the actual velocity estimates using these two different approaches to producing the velocity solution is, is one hundredth of a millimeter per year. This is very, very small differences. So you can see here that actually by speeding up the solution by doing decimation, we get very, very consistent results. There's not necessarily a need to run every single day for many, many years. We could actually produce a prototype solution just by using day one or day three or day five, and we would end up with very good, accurate a priori coordinates. A lot of people ask, what's the difference then between the velocity solution that is created from the time series versus the velocity solution that is estimated in Globe K's Kalman filter? Well, there are some fundamental differences. The main difference is that when you estimate using time series, you are estimating component by component. Site one north, site one east, site one up, site two north, site one, uh, site two east, site two up, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in that sense, you lose the correlation information between components of the same site, the covariances, and you also lose the correlation information, the, the covariance information between sites. This is usually quite small, uh, but nonetheless, it can have a little bit of a difference in the velocities that are produced ultimately. In Globe K's Kalman filter, we are able to retain those covariances, the full covariance matrix that comes from the gamut phase processing. So that's the main difference between the time series and the Globe K Kalman filter estimation. So here on this slide, we compare the differences with those uh, different approaches or different numerical estimating techniques for uh, our solution. So we have three files. The first one, uh, this PBO VEL 150425.vel file, is a time series solution that is just done by uh, regular least squares. You solve for uh, a, um, a linear trend, periodic terms, whatever you want, discontinuities, in a linear uh, least squares sense. And then we reweight the uncertainties using the FOGMEX algorithm uh, to produce more, more realistic precision on the velocity estimates. In the second file, PBO VEL 150425KF, we do the same thing, but rather than a least squares solution with reweighted velocity uncertainties, we use the process noise that we estimated and read in with SH GenStats to do a Kalman filter approach similar to the Globe K Kalman filter with that process noise incorporated. But the big difference here is that we still do not have the covariance information in this Kalman filter because it's still a time series fit using a Kalman filter rather than least squares. 
Finally, the PBO VEL 1504.25 NAM 08.VEL file is the full Globe, Globe K Kalman filter solution retaining the full covariance matrix, uh, all the correlations, including the temporal correlations as well. Uh, and it's decimated to uh, seven days, and it's a combination of 28 small networks. When we look at the differences here, so let's look at the difference first between the uh, least squares solution to the time series and the Kalman filter tip fit to the time series. The differences, again, you can see are at the level of a hundredth of a millimeter per year. Scatter, uh, similarly, at uh, a level of the precision, uh, about 0.1 millimeters per year is approximately the, the, uh, the best velocity uncertainty that you're really gonna get from some of these solutions. Uh, and the NRMS value being close to one uh, basically means that the, uh, the uncertainties relative to uh, the scattering the time series or the, 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 the uncertainties are uh, comparable to one another here. Now looking at the uh, Kalman filter time series estimate versus the Kalman filter full covariance matrix ex estimate from Globe K, again, we see uh, a level of difference uh, with each component of the order of at least less than 0.1 millimeters per year. So this again indicates that there's very little bias being introduced by these different uh, velocity estimate techniques. So the final comments on this um, is it's a good idea to practice very large solutions with decimated data sets, either by using small subnetworks and running each subnetwork separately and then combining the output of that together, um, or perhaps decimating the data set in time by using only one day per week instead of all seven days per week to reduce the initial uh, burden, CPU burden, when, practice, when, when, when running large solutions. The idea of, of, of doing these preliminary solutions is to make sure that your a priori coordinate files and the earthquake files are consistent before running the full solution, um, especially considering those equates and whether they are actually realistic or not. One of the ways that we can do this uh, prototyping is to use the TS fit a program which is much quicker because it uses the time series data only to generate a priori information such as the a priori coordinate file using the out aprf option um, and uh, that will if we use the consistent set of discontinuities for both ts fit to produce the a priori coordinate information if we use the same set of discontinuities and the set and the output a priori information for running globe k then we know that everything that we're doing is consistent that's the end of uh, the talk and uh, we will stop there